Now let's talk about the chemicals. Over here in pack number one, we have the dye. That's the color that we want to put on the cloth. Don't be surprised that the powders are not the same color as the liquid that you'll end up with in the bucket. Most of the dyes look brown. In pack number two, we have salt. It's the catalyst that makes the colors brighter. In pack number three, we have the soda ash. And that is what actually binds the color with the cloth on a molecular level. Many of you may have gone to the flea market and bought a t-shirt there and the guy says to you, go home and wash it in salt and that will stop the color from running. It actually doesn't work at all. The salt is only there to make the colors brighter. It is not the chemical that binds the colors permanently to the cloth. For this little exercise over here, I'm going to talk about these two chemicals, the dye and the soda ash. They have a one-to-one -one relationship. The dye and the soda ash bind together to make a permanent molecular bond on the cloth. Let's try to figure out how this reaction works. These two chemicals react on a one-on-one -on -one basis to form a permanent bond. Just after you've added the chemicals to the pot, you have lots of dye, lots of soda ash, and no bonded material. As time passes, you will have some dye, some soda ash, and a little bit of bonded material. A little bit further down the timeline, and you will have less of the dye, less of the soda ash, and much more of the bonded material. Eventually, you will end up with a whole lot of the bonded material and no more dye and no more soda ash. The challenge is that the mixture that is in the pot looks the same to the naked eye and you cannot see whether there is any of the active ingredient left or whether it's all bonded material. And unfortunately, this bonded material does not unbond again and it no longer has the ability to fix permanently with cloth. Let's look at that one more time. What are the requirements for the dye to be color fast? Firstly, you need to make sure that you've selected the correct fabric. Then, you need to make sure that your chemicals are present at optimum levels. The reaction will also only happen suspended in water. You will need heat to drive the reaction. And we cannot forget that all of this is going to take some time. Let's draw a graph to see how it works in more detail. On this axis, I'm going to put heat. And on this axis over here, I'm going to put time. Over here, we have the optimum temperature of 65 degrees Celsius. Now let's look at what happens to the different colors as you put them into the mixture. Some of them, the reaction will peak out and taper off in this way. Other colors may do something like this. Certain colors will taper off very quickly.
while other colours might taper off more slowly. It's because of this that you can only really control the colour right here at the beginning of the reaction when everything goes in at the optimum temperature. As the dye cools, over time the reaction becomes less and less effective, more of the chemicals become used up, and over here you can no longer control the final colour that you're going to get. That is why dye that you reuse or recycle has an unpredictable colour that you need to just accept when it comes out of the dye bath.